Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Liberty Mail with the Student Fellows of Faith and Freedom. Welcome back to Liberty Mail from the Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College. I'm Katie Kenline, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by Penny Nance, the CEO and President of Concerned Women for America. She's joining us from outside D.C. today. Yep, and um, you'll be listening to this sometime during around the Christmas New Year time because Grace and I are about to go back to um, back home for Christmas time. But we're so glad to be able to give you this episode around the holiday season. Um, today we're going to be talking about Concerned Women for America's role and their influence right now um, in the United States and politics at both national and state level. Um, and I'd like to give our audience a little more background on Penny's work. Uh, Penny Nance's named one of the top four most powerful pro-life female voices by Christian Post. By Newsmax, she was called one of the um, 100 most influential evangelicals in America by Israel Allies Foundation as one of the top 50 Christian allies of Israel. She's a leader on pro-life messaging and policy. She's a weekly political commentator, popular speaker um, at national events, and she appears on all major television networks as a commentator on contemporary events and also on, and she's an expert on domestic issues. We're so excited that she's here with us today. Um, and our audience should know that she um, also served on President Trump's Life Advisory Council, spent a lot of time in the White House as a modern-day Esther, um, advocating for especially Christian women across the country. Um, and we're so glad that she's here to join us today and talk more about the work she does at Concerned Women for America outside D.C. Penny, would you tell us about how Concerned Women got started and the issues that y'all are working on? Well, first, thank you so much, Katie, for having me on. I love everything you do, and you've also done work with our Young Women for America. And uh, it's just an honor to get to know you and other you know, up-and-coming women. Like, I am so grateful to have this whole incredible bench behind me of hard-charging, spiritually mature and incredibly beautiful young women coming up. So, you know, I, it's, you're a great encouragement to me. Thank you. But, you know, I, I stand on the shoulders of other people, too. I stand on the shoulders of Dr. Beverly LaHaye, who in 1979, she's faced with a, a country that is getting ready. Several states had already passed the um, Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. And it wasn't until Christian women woke up out of their, you know, slumber of raising children and being active in their churches to recognize that their country is crumbling around them and that if the Equal Rights Amendment, which was beautifully named, who could be against equal mm -hmm. rights for women, right, um, but deceptively named because what it would do is take away women's ability to have any distinct character in, in law. That meant the very things that we're fighting right now, men in women's locker rooms, in our dorm rooms, um, in our restrooms, the women's sports, it meant that there would be zero ability to state for states to limit abortion. So it was essential that that be tamped down and be fought. And it, again, once Christian women like Beverly LaHaye and our concerned Women for America, women who were the early leaders, and Phyllis Schlafly um, in Illinois, once they got active, they killed it. And that's what it took. It took women's leadership. And it messenger matters on these really mm -hmm. big issues of the day. And I find it just so interesting that Satan has no new tricks. He's not creative at all. It's mm -hmm. the same playbook over and over and over again. And the very things that they were fighting in 1979 that created this you know, movement of women um, are the very things today that Concerned Women for America, again, is doing, fighting for life, fighting for the, un the, the truth of the unique dignity of women mm -hmm. and standing firm in the truth. There's only one truth. It's not your truth and my truth. There's one truth and mm -hmm. standing in God's truth um, because we know the author of truth. And um, and so I am just grateful. I came in 2010, Mrs. LaHay, and I've been involved. I was a young lobbyist before I had my children, and I've been on the board of CWA. But in 2010, Beverly LaHay asked me to come and officially be the president and CEO of Concerned Women for America. And I've been here ever since. And it has been an incredibly wild and joyful ride. In 2011, we started Young Women for mm -hmm. America, and it's just breathed this incredible 
uh, youthfulness into the organization as we've seen these young, incredible leaders step forward. We have two, over 250 Young Women for America active chapters on college campuses around the country. And we've been there with you at Grove City mm -hmm. and many, many others. And uh, it's just been really a beautiful time to get to stand on the steps of the Supreme Court and be there for the historic moment uh, two years ago when the court overturned Roe v. Wade, something that Beverly LaHaye and the early founders of CWA had prayed for and worked for and marched for and gone to their state capitals to um, agitate for and to educate. And we got to be here to see it. And I am just incredibly, will always be grateful for that and recognizing that because of that, between 30,000 and 60,000 babies survive per year. Mm -hmm. And those numbers are only going to grow over time. Amen. Yes. Well, and one of the ways that we got here that we've seen God working behind the scenes, opening all these doors, one of the ways that we got to um, the Dobbs decision was three Supreme Court justices appointed by the um, Trump administration. And how I found out about Concerned Women back um, in September, the fall of 2018, was you all um, were working hard to make sure that we got strong justices on the court. And this was during um, the Kavanaugh hearings. Would you tell us a little bit about the work you did for uh, to make sure that we had these three solid justices? Yes. Oh, my goodness. What an incredible <laughs> moment in history. And again, a very wild ride. So, yes. um, you know, we can't I can't talk about this without actually giving credit where credit's due. And that is President Trump, mm -hmm. who ran on the idea for the first time ever that he would only appoint constitutional constitutionalist judges to the Supreme Court and in all the lower courts. So he did that. He followed through on his promise. We have over 220 lower court judges and three Supreme Court justices at the very beginning. And there's a long story about how that all worked out. Concerned Women for America worked hard to make sure that the next administration could actually appoint judges. So that meant right away, as soon as President Trump uh, was sworn in and at the inauguration that I was called into the White House to meet with him about Neil Gorsuch. Mm. And so Neil Gorsuch was confirmed. It actually was pretty smooth. And then mm -hmm. the next one, of course, was uh, replacing um, th the next judge justice was uh, Brett Kavanaugh. And that's when all you know what broke loose. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, it was it was pandelirium. And what I witnessed is really the first time ever in all my years, all the things I've done, all the rallies I've attended, all the the even the the um, events that I've held in front of the White House opposing the Iran deal, like all where Code Pink invaded. Uh -huh. The only time I've ever been truly afraid for my safety was during the Kavanaugh hearings and during at that time because you had George Soros, this is well documented, spending $240 million with the Women's March mm -hmm. to bring in women from around the country who were, I, I have to tell you, Katie, were the most broken women I have ever seen in mm -hmm. my entire life. These were women who had been violated, who were hurt, who were, you know, these are women who were tatted up in broken women. And, I, and I'm and i not suggesting that having a tattoo somehow is a character flaw. It's not. But I'm just telling you, these women were shaved heads, sad, broken, angry women, because they were told that the Supreme Court was getting ready, was getting ready to, or the Senate was getting ready to confirm a rapist to the Supreme Court. Like there was no reality whatsoever in what the lies that these women have been fed, nothing. And thankfully, you know, uh, I heard somebody say that, you know, a lie travels around the world twice before the truth's ever even gotten its shoes on. And that's mm. true. But wow. fortunately, Concerned Women for America and other organizations were there to make sure the truth got out. We went on our Women for Kavanaugh bus tour and went to the key states where senators that were on Judiciary Committee were going to have to vote for him, but and also were up for re-election and made sure that we were doing media there, we were doing rallies there, making sure they were hearing from women in their state that recognized, it, first off, it was a lie. And secondly, there's this new standard that is made up that if you are accused of something, that there doesn't have to be any proof. Mm 
-hmm. that it's just your word against a woman. And somehow, because you're a woman, you have this super morality that, you know, it completely, uh, the common sense is cast aside to understand that reckon that women are broken too, right? And sometimes women sin, and sometimes mm-hmm. women lie. Mm-hmm. And in this case, they did lie. Um, uh, uh, Christy Blasey Ford w- was the only person that was able to was willing to say that that that, that something happened in high school that she was touched inappropriately or whatever. Nobody else believed that. Even the person that was with her that night, that she says was with her that night, says that she has zero recollection of that. No one that went to school with her thought that that was true. And I even met other young women who were in her class, or I guess they're my age now, older <laughs> women, who were in her class that were there at the time that knew Brett Kavanaugh very personally. And they said, no, I knew those guys and he was not one of them. He actually was the good guy. If your car broke down or you needed something, he's the guy you trusted. And so this was a manufactured of whole cloth because the truth was they were afraid of the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Mm-hmm. And let me just tell you that I have, you know, sadly been around for a while in various administrations. And Donald Trump is the only president I truly believe that would have stood firm in this with the kind of pressure that was put on him. President Trump said, no, it's a lie. I'm not going to remove him. I'm not going to ask him to step down. And so I really appreciated that he was in it for the long haul. He was going to support his candidate and gave us enough time to actually get the truth out there Mm -hmm. and to convince people like Senator Susan Collins from Maine, who's a who, who's not pro-life, but actually believes in justice and truth and doesn't think that it, we can allow stand, to stand the standard that one voice, one, one woman saying one man did something to her means that he is discredited for the rest of his life. He can't. He gets fired from jobs. He can't serve in public office. He, you know, all manner of things are going to happen to him because of that. That is. In our country, we believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, and we Mm -hmm. have to maintain that standard. And so it was an incredible time, very high highs, very low emotional lows. But we were in it for the long haul. We had to have paid uh, armed security to do our rallies in order to do our Senate visits. And and one a group of and we brought women in from around the country Mm -hmm. to speak to their senators. Someone in our party, it was actually a young man, got punched in the face by an angry protester. um, Without he did nothing to elicit that response, Mm -hmm. Uh, but they were just angry. And uh, at some level, I felt very sorry for them. And uh, the Washington Post recorded after the vote, I came into the Hart Building, kicked my high heels up and often stood on top of a bench in the building and we all grabbed hands and we prayed for those women Mm. because we felt deeply their hurt and were and i was grateful that i was able to see that it was like a blind man stepping on Mm -hmm. your foot like they truly did not understand and so I was grateful that the Holy Spirit, because it would have been easy to be angry back, but uh-huh. the Holy Spirit was good and gave us compassion for them. Amen. And that was the right response. The fact that Donald Trump stood with Brett Kavanaugh and that CWA, the leading women's organization, was able to push him through meant that now when Ruth uh, RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, passed away, there was another opening and it was we we knew about Amy Coney Barrett and we were advocating that she would be the per, the person that's picked uh-huh. and i literally had a conversation with president trump and said you know what she is a great jurist mm-hmm. she would be the only mother of small children she has seven children actually sitting on the high court mm-hmm. it is her time we would urge you to choose her and he did Um, Had Brett Kavanaugh, had we not been able to get that done, I think the president would have learned a different lesson and perhaps not chosen um, Amy Coney Barrett. But we were grateful that he stuck in there and we were all able to do the work. And uh, and also, I don't want to diminish the prayers Mm -hmm. that happen around the country. I mean, we asked uh, our members, we, we wanted to send a list later after it was all over to Brett Kavanaugh's family of, you know, really other notes, because he has little girls that are going to grow up one day and they're going to look at this record. So we just sent out a note to our members on email and said, hey, if you'd like to have a message to the Kavanaugh family, send it to us. In 
uh, just a few hours, we had 20,000 responses. Wow. And at the end of it, I don't know how many hundred thousand we had, but we put them on a thumb drive and said, you know what? When your children get old enough to really look into this, we want them to have a complete record that what a vast majority of women in this in this country believed and wanted. And so that was incredible. All of that leading to the opportunity that for Lynn Fitch, who's the attorney general mm -hmm. of Mississippi, to bring forward the Dobbs case. And when she, the case was brought forward to, from the lower court to the Supreme Court, she could have just pushed back and pushed the limit, which at that time, based on Casey and Roe, was fetal viability. Mm -hmm. Well, anybody that knows anything about fetal viability, it's like late in pregnancy. It's like 20, 22 weeks. We have babies earlier and earlier that is are, are actually are living mm -hmm. and all the fetal surgeries and all of those. But the, the Dobbs case was about a 15-week uh, ban that they passed in the state of Mississippi. And Lynn Fitch, who is an incredible, beautiful woman, believer, strong believer, said, we're not going to argue this based on 15 weeks. We're going to argue for a complete overturn of Roe. Uh -huh. So now states will be able to actually set the limits where they want to set the limits. And she, it worked. <laughs> and she did it. And because that, we had those three Trump justices it happened. We actually were able to overturn Roe v. Wade, have this argument on the state level, which is what we had always wanted to do, start to build, um, you know, a, a consensus. And I don't love that word because the consensus isn't the goal. The mm -hmm. goal is to protect babies, but mm -hmm. so that we can perhaps have a federal limit. We've got a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. but we have now, you know, about 25, 24 states pulled back their their uh, their pro their limits on abortion, made them earlier or or in some cases not at all or very, very, very uh, limited reasoning for abortion. And then, you know, we have some states like New York and California who went up till up till birth. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do, a lot of education to do on fetal development and the resources that women have, but we are grateful to be able to fight this battle now in a way we've never been able to before. Mm -hmm. It's incredible to hear the testimonies. And we could, I know that we could talk for a really long time about this, but just real quickly, because it's um, something that we're seeing all over the news right now um, and is one of Concerned Women for America's core issues, support for Israel. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had a prayer vigil here um, on campus. I helped organize praying for a precious little girl who was three and turned four um, named Abigail. And you all at Concerned Women where again, this voice of you have um, grassroots prayer across the country on college campuses and with um, members of Concerned Women praying for this. Um, but then at the same time, would you tell us just a little bit of what you were able to do um, just on the bigger yeah. scale? Well, and, and you mentioned that we were noticing, of course, all the just vile poison coming out, all the anti-Semitism that was erupting on college campuses, especially even the Ivy League campuses around this country. And so we kept saying to our YWA chapter leaders, like, go to the Israel rallies, make sure you bring all your friends, put it on social media. And then we got back the response of like, they aren't having them. Uh huh. <laughs> and so we we're like, well, then that means we're going to because, you know, somebody has to lead. And sometimes I catch myself and look, somebody needs to do that. And then I'm like, wait, oh, yeah, we're somebody. So we gotta <laughs> Amen. Do that. Amen. And so we're the somebody that does the thing. And uh, and so I really felt like the Lord leading us. And so we've had great response. We've done 10 rallies now across the country on college campuses. I just was out leading prayer at um, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills with uh uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs Church with 2,000 people watching uh, live, being in the building, and then another 100,000 watching online. And it's been this great moment where the church has risen up in all its different you know, manifestations, either as a campus chapter or maybe in an act, individual churches. And I'm just, it's incredible to watch the Lord work. It is high time. You know, it breaks my heart as I started learning the history mm -hmm. of what happened in the Holocaust. And although as a young kid, you know, I read, I read Corey Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place, and I was so proud of the fact that she hid Jews and she went to Auschwitz because of it. But why that book's notable is because she was the notable exception. I mean, that's the reality. No one likes to say it and I hate hearing it. It breaks my heart to say it. 
but that most people in the church turned their head, did not intervene. Even in the United States, we did not let Jews in as we should have. We didn't blow up the train tracks the way we should have. The Christian church was was AWOL in many areas. And again, that's not everybody. There, You have very notable people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Corey Tim Boom and many others. That they're, they're recognized as righteous among the nations uh, if you go to Yad Vashem. Mm-hmm. But overall, that wasn't the case. There was a Christian church at, literally on the campus of Auschwitz at the concentration camp mm-hmm. where SS soldiers went. And so that's the reality. But this is today. And when I went to Israel um, the, for the first time, I think it was like 2013, I visited Yavashim. And this question weighed on me afterwards for, I mean, really heavy on my heart. What would I have done? And it wasn't until, and it's kind of a long story, but a Jewish woman ended up striking up a conversation with me and asked me what I was learning. And I shared with her that she challenged me that I was asking myself the wrong question. I'll never know the answer to that. I'll never know. But the question is, what am I doing now? Mm -hmm. And so that was the moment where I said, from here on out, I and Concerned Women for America will stand firm for Israel and stern firm against anti-Semitism. This is this moment. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't have known. I mean, there's many things that have happened since that day, but really the most outrageous happening on October 7th. And at the beginning, because I've been to Israel many times, we found out there were rockets coming over from Gaza. I mean, I don't know. Sadly, I kind of shrugged because it happens all the time, but I didn't understand at that moment that it was air, sea, and land invasion. I didn't understand the Hamas terrorists were gonna go into kibbutz and murder about 1,200 innocent civilians, murder their children, rape their women, the young women and children, gang rape them, use it as a tool of war. And this is something the left does not want to acknowledge, but we, I was asked, we were asked to take a group of families who are American families of American citizens who've been taken captive to Capitol Hill and introduce them to members of Congress. Mm -hmm. And so someone reached out and we said, sure, we'll do that. I mean, they wanted to do it, but they didn't know who to reach out to. And we're like, we'll do it. And they said, but you only have 24 hours to put it together. Mm -hmm. So we reached out to, which is this how these things come down, right? So we reached out to Cindy Hyde-Smith, who's a beautiful believer, incredible senator from Mississippi, and Kathy McMorris-Rogers, who Uh you well know, Katie, from Washington State, who is a prayer warrior, and said, would you host other women members to meet with them? And we had incredible meetings, not dry in the place in which these members in Kathy's meetings were Democrats and Republicans mm-hmm. and all these women senators all pledged their support. In that meeting, I met a woman named Elizabeth, who is the great aunt of Abigail Adon, who you mentioned. She was three years old when she was taken in captivity and she turned four in captivity. Her story is she lived in Faraza, which is this little beautiful picturesque kibbutz that I have visited on the border of Gaza. On October 7th, a Hamas terrorist came in. Her mother was at home. Uh, Abigail's mother was at home with her two siblings, 10 and 6. The Hamas terrorist came in. The children were in the safe room. He shot and murdered her mother in front of the children. The little children, her siblings, went to look for their father. They go out to the road, and there's their father running back towards his house. He's realized what had happened, carrying little Abigail. And on the road, he is shot and murdered by the Hamas terrorist. He falls over on top of Abigail, and so the little children think that they're both dead, so they go back to their safe room where they wait for over 14 hours for Mm -hmm. someone to come get them without food, without water, without, I mean, again, waiting with their mother's dead body, and so we have no idea, you know, what the trauma is going to be for them. Abigail was not dead. She wiggled out from underneath her father's dead body, covered in his blood, went to the neighbor's house, but then... Later on, Hamas terrorists came and kidnapped the entire neighbor, all the neighbors, the the mom, the little children there, and took Abigail with them. the The good news is that you know when during the cease, short ceasefire, Abigail was brought was brought back to her family, mm-hmm. and she was released. But also understand, she was released to her family without her parents because both of her parents 
were murdered. She's an orphan now. She will be taken in by her family. God knows what the other trauma was that while she was held captive. And we're starting to hear stories of the things that happened to these women and children while they were held in captivity. Because I got to tell you, Hamas fighters are demonic. Mm -hmm. I watched the 46 minute mm -hmm. uh, live video uh, that was taken and collected by the IDF from the GoPro cams and cameras and dashboard cameras. And I would not even describe to you the evil I saw, but what I saw were young men rejoicing as they did these most evil, vile acts you can possibly imagine, even calling and uh, bragging to their parents who are in Gaza that they had the blood of 10 Jews on his hands with his own hands. He, their son had murdered 10 Jews and the parents response, they praised Allah. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that, you know, the IDF has an incredible, important work to do in order to keep Israelis safe. We want to continue to pray to, for the protection and the release of the hostages. And we want to pray for God's justice to, to protect the Israelis and to protect the IDF as they go about this task. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so grateful that you could join us today, Penny, and we could continue to talk more. We'll have to do a part two at some point for yes. all of our listeners. Um, but with, for all of uh, you listening, please, um, you can go online and find all kinds of social media for Penny Nance. She's um, P.Y. Nance on all of the platforms. Um, and you can look up Concern Women for America, um, visit their website, their social media, too, to hear more about the advocacy they're doing for you, for me, Um everyone across the this great country, what they're doing for us in D.C. But I'm so grateful again that you could join us. And also to our audience, um, we will be grateful to bring you another episode um, next week. And thank you all um, for listening to these incredible stories today. Thank you, Katie. God bless. For more information on the Institute for Faith and Freedom, visit faithandfreedom.com.